He grew up in Sioux City, graduated from high school at age 15. He was one of the stars of the high school debate team. He was in the National Honor Society, and he loved baseball. He was also a skilled shortstop. And when he was a spy later in life and living in New York City, he was renowned for being able to reel off the history and stats of every big league pitcher. (laughs) So he played bridge. He belonged to a bowling league. He was a fan of Walt Whitman. His life really personified that Cold War battle of the American dream versus the communist workers' paradise. Of all the World War II spies who stole atomic secrets from the Manhattan Project, none were as successful or as unassuming as George Koval. He was a kid from Iowa who played baseball and loved Walt Whitman. But he was also from a family of Russian immigrants who spent years in the Soviet Union in the 1930s and he was eventually recruited and trained as a spy by the proto-KGB. Koval was a gifted science student, and he enrolled at Columbia University and befriended the scientists who were soon to join the Manhattan Project. After being drafted into the U.S. Army, he used his scientific background and connections to secure assignments at the most secret sites of the Manhattan Project, where plutonium and uranium were produced to fuel the atomic bomb. Unbeknownst to his friends and colleagues, for years George passed top-secret information on the atomic bomb to his handlers of Moscow. The intelligence he provided made its way to the Soviet atomic program, which produced a bomb identical to America's years earlier than U.S. experts had expected, and no one suspected George. He eventually returned to the Soviet Union, and his secret identity was only known to top intelligence officials, and his story was only brought to light after the fall of the USSR. He was never caught, he escaped without a scratch, and his story remains little known to this day. To get into the story is today's guest, Anne Hagedorn. She's the author of Sleeper Agent, The Atomic Spy in America Who Got Away. And we delve into the psychology of the spy, showing the hopes, fears, and beliefs that spurred Koval's decisions, and how he was able to be so successful, yet be so unassuming at the same time. I really enjoy stories of spycraft, and I've devoted many episodes to people like him, Richard Sorge, who was a Soviet spy in Japan and even George Washington spies in the Revolutionary War. And there's a lot to unpack here. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Anne Hagedor. Anne, welcome to the show. I'm very honored to be here. Well, this is going to be a lot of fun because I have explored spycraft many times uh, on this podcast, whether George Washington spies in the Revolutionary War or different World War II spies. And George Koval is interesting because he breaks the mold of what we think a spy is and does. There's World War II spies like Dusko Popov, who's arguably the inspiration for James Bond, very charismatic, very dashing figure. Richard Sorge, a Soviet spy in Japan who befriends all these figures, and that's how he gathers his intelligence. But George is different. He's very buttoned down, as you'll get into, but his results speak for themselves. He's arguably the most successful spy in World War II. So what attracted you to his story And how does he break the mold of a typical World War II spy? I could write a book about that. (laughs) (laughs) One could say. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no. I discovered George while doing an interview for another book idea I had. And with, with narrative nonfiction, either from the very start, you find a story that grabs you and you can't let go, or you find an issue that is very important that could fall through the cracks. And so then you have to find a narrative to bring it alive because what I do is true stories delivered to the general reader through the art of storytelling. So in this case, and I have to say it's rare that something like this would happen. I was doing interviews for a what I thought was a fabulous World War I story and I was trying to put together the pieces of a narrative And at the end of this interview, this 92-year-old gentleman, very bright guy, he'd been very helpful. But at the end of it, he said, you know, I I heard something the other day that I think you should write a book about. (laughs) And as you know, when those things happen, skepticism rises, curiosity and skepticism together drive you to ask a bunch of questions. So by the end of the interview, I was told that in Dayton, Ohio, which is where I was born and lived till the eighth grade, there had been a Soviet spy and that there had been a secretive project within the highly secretive Manhattan Project right there in Dayton. 
And I asked the gentleman, and, and he explained there was a Soviet spy. He said, I know this is true from the person who told me. And I said, can you give me that person's name? No. Oh, no, I promised, you know, da, 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 da. And then he had no name. So and I thanked him. And then I went on for about two weeks with the other project. And I couldn't stop thinking about this because it was something I had never heard about. And I thought I better get it out of my mind so I can go forward. So I did some digging and didn't have to dig far because 10 years before that, there had been an article in the New York Times that talked about a George Koval because he had just received the posthumous award from Vladimir Putin, hero of the Russian Federation. And that so I had the name, and then after that, I I thought, well, I'll give it three or four weeks of exploration and just see how far I can take it in terms of a list of what I, I had to find out if I was going to flush it out into a biography to find out whether it was doable or not. I sent off a bunch, I called the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, got some great tutorials on the best way to file uh, Freedom of Information Acts. Um, then jumped in the car, drove to DC, to College Park, Maryland, spent about a week and a half or about a week at the National Archives, did a bunch of interviews. And that was basically the turning point. It took me a while, of course, to get any FBI reports, but the main turning point uh, was in DC. And I realized that at that point, mainly because of, of some of the files I found in College Park with the help of a fabulous archivist, but I realized it was very doable. And, and what I realized on that trip through interviews was that it wasn't just doable, but it had significance. And, and those, uh, my five criteria for books like this are, you know, it has to be doable research wise, there has to be something really fresh, new that can come out of it, it has to have significance for the general reader, it has to have literary potential. And it has got to have writerly passion. I mean, it's got to rouse my literary passion. And so it, this had, had it all. And the truth is, as anyone who knows me can tell you, I don't think I took a day off from after that trip for years. You know, I just was so locked into it. And because it, it was quite a challenge. He was never caught. This is a spy who was never caught. And if a spy is caught, of course, there's going to be uh, a trial and trial transcripts. But I didn't have that. And so putting my sources besides some really excellent interviews and some secondary sources that I referred to for the all the domains of the context of his life. All the rest of the sources were letters, journals, postcards, news clips, yearbooks, photos, maps, tax records. I made a list today, ship manifests, passports, arrest records, application forms, even inscriptions in books, and of course, thousands of pages of FBI reports. Had a wonderful Russian translator and, and a great research assistant who indexed like about six or 7,000 pages of FBI file of reports and did endless timelines. Those chronologies are crucial. But at any rate, the way I got the story was by accident and uh, not by accident, but through an interview with someone else for a different story. And that mix of curiosity and skepticism is quite powerful. It will drive you to lots of research and <laughs> many days, weeks, months, and years of piecing together the puzzle of a guy's life like this. So, Right. Not easy to find for the reasons that you mentioned, because his story was only known publicly in the 21st century. So getting into his background, his family's background, the reason he was successful is because it was so unique where he could fully immerse himself into the Soviet Union, yet pass as an American. And we were discussing before hitting record that he's part of 
a Russian immigrant community in Iowa, actually of the same community that produced Ann Landers and Dear Abby. So be careful about folksy Iowans. Their powers can be used for good by providing advice to the public or for evil by potentially starting a global thermonuclear war. So there's uh, incredible power that can be harnessed rightly or wrongly. But anyway, please tell me about his background and his family's background. Well, he, he is fascinating on so many levels. But in general, he was born and raised in Iowa. You know, his parents came through. There's so many interesting little details in the context of his story. The way I have designed the book, there's a prologue, there's an epilogue, and then parts one, two, and three. Part one is the lure, which is really how he grew up and what grabbed him in terms of to become the spy he became. There was an idealism in his family that was instilled in him. And, and that happened largely because his parents were victims of anti-Semitism in Tsarist Russia. His father came to America in 1910 through the Ellis Island of the West, which is so utterly fascinating. You know, it's coming into America through Galveston, Texas. So that's a story in and of itself. And there are parts of that in part one. So his parents came in 1910, 1911. They were married in Sioux City, Iowa, had three children, and George was born on December 25th, 1913. He grew up in Sioux City, graduated from high school at age 15. He was one of the stars of the high school debate team. He was in the National Honor Society, and he loved baseball. And there's a story in the book about what happened in Sioux City when he was a kid that probably inspired his love of baseball. He was also a skilled shortstop. And when he was a spy later in life and living in New York City, he was renowned for being able to reel off the history and stats of every big league pitcher (laughs) So, he, you know, he played bridge. He belonged to a bowling league. This is when he lived in New York. He was a fan of Walt Whitman's. I mean, he could recite Walt Whitman. He grew up in as one of the early readers of the book said he really he his his life personified. And from the start, it really did from after the Russian Revolution on. His life really personified that American dream, that Cold War battle of the American dream versus the communist workers paradise. Because he grew up, you know, you can understand after the Russian Revolution, anti-Semitism was illegal in, in the new Russia. So his parents were firm believers in finding an ism that would end world oppression basically. And they believed that communism, they believed in the ideal, his parents did. And and so that's the atmosphere he grew up in. You know, on the one hand, he was playing baseball, reciting American poets, a star in his high school, many friends, all the way through all the FBI files. And people were interviewed in the 1950s in Sioux City. And, you know, all the way through his experience in the Army, in New York, the Manhattan Project, et cetera, et cetera. And there, there wasn't a single person who said he wasn't a charming, just great to be around guy who was very hardworking, you know, very dedicated scientist, always there to take the place of someone if they were sick. You know, there are all kinds of stories like that. Not only did he blend in, but he was a popular guy. And one other little detail I probably should add is that he was apparently quite the ladies man. Hmm. There are only two of his girlfriends in the book. The one he had when he was in Dayton and the one he had in New York toward the end of his stay in America. So that's George and charming yet. I I have a line in the book somewhere that kind of describes it, his tapestry of truths and half truths and many lies, lies (laughs) and half truths. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So let's talk about how they actually go back to the Soviet Union. So what's the process of them picking up and leaving? So what is their life like there? And then what eventually leads George to be recruited? 
Well, that's an excellent question. And many times people have asked me, especially friends of mine who come from Russian Jewish backgrounds, once they were in America, that, this is, that's the whole concept of this sort of tug of war in his life between the American dream and the communist ideals. Why would they want to leave? Well, you have to put yourself, you, you have to really do a lot of research and put yourself in the shoes of the Kovals in the 1920s. And in the book, you'll read a lot about what was happening in America in the 1920s in terms of anti-Semitism. So they were back in the throes of prejudice once again. So in 1932, they left America, returned to Russia, the new Russia, Soviet Union. And what drove them to do that, the combination of anti-Semitism surrounding them and also a pledge of great possibilities in what was called the Jewish Autonomous Region, which was in the Soviet Far East. And it was an organization in the United States called i which was for the colonization of Jews in Russia. It was a plan for a, an, an area, a huge, immense area in the Soviet Far East dedicated to Yiddish and Jewish culture, Yiddish especially. And George's father was the head of the regional group in, in the Great Plains that was trying to encourage Jews to move from America to the Soviet Far East, to the Jewish autonomous, autonomous region, which was called Biro Bizan. So his parents moved there. He, you know, they live in a collective. They become highly respected, the whole family. And then he wins an award and earns some money to go to Moscow. And there he applies to college in chemistry and, and graduates in 1939, I think he graduates. He gets married, he marries a fellow student in 1936. So he is, like I've said before, you had to put yourself in the shoes of the people at the time. And in 1939, George Koval was all set to go to graduate school. He had been accepted. But within the same week that he was accepted, World War II began, September 1st, 1939. And his commitments, or his requirements in the Soviet Army, in the Red Army, changed at that point. So that's fact number one. Fact number two, his wife was from Imperial Russia aristocracy, and they had problems because of that with the government. And... Also, there were all kinds of details. You had to read what was happening, where they were living. And they had a, a fellow tenant who was tattling on them. And he owned a typewriter and they were having social gatherings and all kinds of stuff. So he had a long list of issues that would put himself and mainly from his point of view, his family at risk as the nation, the world was uh, tilting toward war. I think that figured into his becoming a spy, but you also have accepting the recruitment. I honestly don't think he had much choice, partly because of these reprimands that were occurring, but also because this was a time of much needed Red Army intelligence because of Stalin's purges at that time in 1939, that whole period. And then there is the very important fact that from the point of view of Red Army intelligence, George Kovo was perfect for the job to send to a target country like the United States. His assignment would be and was to report back details about chemical weapons where was the United States in the development of their chemical weapons? That was his assignment when he was sent. What could be better than sending someone whose English had no accent? I mean, George had a hard time learning Russian. So mm -hmm. his Russian had an English accent. You know, he had a difficult time with that. In one of his letters uh, to relatives in the United States, he commented on that. So he was, he was an all-American guy. 
And what is a sleeper agent? You know, a sleeper agent is uh, a spy who is uh, sent to the target country to blend in and, you know, doesn't have uh, uh, diplomatic legal, uh, diplomatic cover. And so they must blend in. And, and the amount of training that goes into that, you know, variety of spies, it takes quite a while. But with George, it wouldn't because he knew the American cult. So his recruitment was one part the need because there were holes in the Red Army intelligence at that point from the purges. He wanted to protect his family from any damages that could occur because of the reprimands. And from the Red Army's point of view, he was ideal to do the job. But without interviewing him, <laughs> you can't find out exactly why he did it. But I think those are the reasons right there. And I think the number one reason was to protect his family. Because okay. if he was a GRU intelligence officer, then his family would be protected. And if you look at what happened to his family during the war, you can see that that was true. And if he had died, they would have been protected. The GRU would have done that. Yeah. So once he returns to the United States, he's trained. What's his process of getting himself connected to where he could gather meaningful intelligence? Because he doesn't have a roadmap for getting into the Manhattan Project because they wouldn't know what that is since it's top secret. So how does he begin this process? Well, he had a very well-connected handler who was very well connected to the Soviet consulate in New York. You know, he came back and that's a part for readers to look forward to is the story of how he got back into the United States. That was quite a challenge trying to figure that out. But he, he returned in autumn of 1940 and there are little details of his life in New York. He ended up in New York City, living in the Bronx. And, and one of the most interesting details to me is that after he registered in the U.S. Army, he registered in, I think, January of 1941. And that allowed him to, because he came in on a false passport, so that allowed him to become George Koval again. He registered in the Army. So now he was George Koval, who had moved from Iowa to New York City. And, mm -hmm. you know, who, who was going to figure out what had happened between 1932 and 1940? At that point, there was no reason to do that. So, and so then one of the first things he does, first of all, when you read the book, you see how well connected and experienced his Soviet handler was. And so long story short, he enrolled at Columbia to take Columbia University to take chemistry courses and what, what was called then the University Extension Program. And that's one of those great research details because at that point, I mean, you could say he's just moved to a new city. He wants to go back to school because there is a pattern in George Koval's life he, where he goes back to school all the time to get degrees. And this time, you know, it, it really wasn't about that because at the time he enrolled, Columbia had become a magnet for some of the most highly regarded physicists and chemists in the world, some destined to play stellar roles in the upcoming production of the first atomic bomb. And in May of 1940, there had been, I can see it now, it was May 5th, 1940, and the New York Times had been a front page story about the physics experiments and accomplishments and the kind of excitement about physics at Columbia University. Obviously, his handler had read that. So by the time George came, I think his assignment had probably changed from chemical weapons to exploration of what exactly was happening at Columbia, you know, start networking. You know, he was a real joiner. You know, he joined clubs. He was so friendly and curious and bright that, you know, he was constantly ma making friends. And, and so at any rate, he, he did that. And that was in 1941. And then there are all kinds of things that happened in 41 and 42. He was working at a cover shop in Manhattan in the Chelsea neighborhood and connecting with various 
spies whose names will be familiar to some readers. And then he gets drafted. And then his boss, who is his handler, makes sure that he's deferred for about a year. I think there were three deferments saying that, you know, George was chairman of the board of this company that was running this electronics shop that had many war contracts. And so he was doing his duty in that way. Then they stopped applying for deferments. And I think he enlisted in February of 1943 went to Fort Dix, went to the Citadel. And then George took the army classification test and what was considered a high score was 115, I think, as I recall, and he scored 152. And so he was brought immediately into something, an elite group called the Army Specialized Training Program, which was sending new recruits in the U.S. Army who scored high, who had scientific backgrounds to universities nationwide. And so to in, increase their scientific expertise for a year. So he went to City College of New York, did that for a year. And then some of the ASTP members, I think there were 700 in his group at City College. And 12 out of those were chosen to be part of the Special Engineer Detachment, another sort of elite group of scientists. And that group went to Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, the different sites of the Manhattan Project, and most of them worked for the top-level scientists. George Koval became a health physicist at, at Oak Ridge, which he- is a really important detail, health physics, yeah. Well, at this time, I mean, he's a student at different universities. He's probably a good decade older than other people in his class. And so he's able to connect socially. But how is he received by people? Does anyone find it a little bit strange? Does he accidentally pick up a couple of habits from Russia that he comes over and once in a while people think, oh, he does this or that differently? That's weird. Or do you have a sense of how he's received at this time? Oh, yes. There were many interviews done in the 1950s after it was discovered. He was discovered, I think, in 1954, summer of 54. But there were many, many interviews. And then later in life, he reconnected with one of his colleagues at Oak Ridge, and they exchanged letters and emails, and that was into the new century. Also, I interviewed a 98-year-old gentleman who double-dated with George at Oak Ridge, and he told me a lot about George's personality. They even took a trip together to New York on one of their leaves. And, you know, it, 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 his comment was that, you know, there, there was no, no reason to be suspicious. There was nothing really odd about him at all. And that detail of his being older was something um, both the 98-year-old gentleman and the friend he had exchanges with later They both commented on the fact everybody knew he was 10 years older and they just thought that was great because he had some wisdom, not necessarily wisdom. He just knew all kinds of things that some of them didn't. And so they never looked at it as something to be suspicious about. And, Hmm. And again, you have to go back in time. You have to go to the historical moments. Who were you suspicious of in those days, the potential for a German spy. You were listening for the German accent. You weren't questioning why one of your colleagues was older than you. So it's like uh, a lot of the story really is about psychology. It's not just about, it it delves into the psychology of the spy, what motivated him, what spurred his accomplishments, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also about really getting deeply into the psychology of the period in history, you know, and put yourself, uh, Scott, in in that situation. If you knew someone like this, would you be suspicious of him? Yeah, I mean, it's a testimony to how well he was able to roll with things and not have people question it. So you mentioned that he is then recruited or drafted, he's placed into a health inspection, which is critical later on. So what was the significance of that? And how did that lead to the next stage of his blossoming as an atomic spy? 
I found the health physics detail fascinating. I mean, that was just something on an application or some form that I found. And so, of course, I was very curious about it. I I spent about 10 days in Oak Ridge in uh, this wonderful archive called the Oak Ridge Room. And in that archive, I found a whole section on health physics because health, the health physics department in Oak Ridge, I believe it was the first in the country to measure levels of radiation, to figure out ways to best measure levels of radiation contamination. So there were even interviews in the FBI files with the founder of that group who knew what George was doing. He knew what his assignments were. And he was quoted as saying that at that time, the information pertaining to health physics during Koval's tenure at Oak Ridge was classified. But what's most interesting is what the daily routine is, because (laughs) it's one thing to put a line on a resume, health physics, and another to find out exactly what that meant. And that meant that he had to learn the basic chemical properties of all the radioactive materials they were monitoring. Health physicists had to be present whenever there was repair work done on any equipment at the plants. No shipment could leave the site without the approval of the health physicists. The health physicists conducted routine daily surveys of all offices and labs as they checked for the signs of contamination. And one of the great things, I found the training manuals for them. And at the very beginning of one of those, it says three important steps for the health physics workers who are always noted in their training materials. And those three at the very front, know all operations in your area, be alert to all changes, make thorough surveys on a routine level. It sounds like you couldn't ask for a better job if you want to reverse engineer the entire manufacturing process of creating atomic weapons. Well, yes. And and because if you look at the design of all the sites at Oak Ridge, uh, you can see how far away the plants were from each other. So he had a Jeep. So here was this uh, Soviet spy driving around on an, in the U.S. Army Jeep checking all the facilities. Although... I have to say the one that he spent the most time at, further research led me to find that he spent most of his time at a facility called the X-10. That was the code name, X-10 facility. And that was where there was a graphite uh, reactor and they were creating plutonium. And also they were irradiating bismuth to synthesize polonium. So those were the two areas that, you know, he became probably the most knowledgeable about, you know, the the fuel volumes, et cetera, et cetera, because Oak Ridge was the site in the Manhattan Project that created the, and Hanford, Washington, created the plutonium. But uranium, plutonium, and then the synthesized, uh, the irradiated bismuth for the polonium were all done at Oak Ridge. And then Los Alamos, it was all shipped to Los Alamos where the bombs were designed and built as well as the triggers. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, I'm curious as he's gathering this intelligence, I don't know if your archival research mentioned this, but How does he give it back to his handler? You imagine that they meet on a park bench and he tapes it under the bench and he says the crow flies at midnight and someone picks it up, which there's probably better ways to pass things along, especially if you're being tailed. So do you know how he was able to pass it on to his handler? No, there are all possibilities. The only way to come close to that is who visited him when he was at Oak Ridge. So I got all the visitor records who visited him, who, or rather, who visited Oak Ridge in a a set period of time, who who had a connection to the cover shop or to the handler, and that was doable. And then when did he go to New York from Oak Ridge? And I found that out through the interview with the 98-year-old friend. And and then later in the year, that's in 1945, then after he is transferred to Dayton, where the polonium is 
produced and purified. He, once he goes to Dayton, there is another ship, not shipment, but, you know, another segment of information that goes to Moscow. And that had to have happened after November 1st, 1945, because it includes the volume of polonium being made in Dayton as of November 1st, 1945. So you have to put together all these timelines and travel, et cetera, et cetera. And then to figure out exactly or come as close as possible to when the information was sent. And then on the receiving end through my Russian translator, there were ways to find out when certain pieces of information would have been sent to what was called Department S, which is where the NKGB and the GRU spies in America working on focusing on the atomic bomb would send the information. Anyhow, so basically you put together timelines, but there is no way to know exactly how that happened. Like I said, if he had been caught and charged and there was a trial there would be transcripts and testimony and et cetera, et cetera, to refer to, but we don't have that. So what do you do? You put together timelines, you nail down the exact people involved. For example, Pavel Mikhailov, who was the vice consul at the Soviet consulate on East 60th Street in New York. He worked with George's handler, and he left America in December 1945. So I think between that November 1st and the time Pavel Mikhailov left in mid-December 1945, that information regarding the polonium that George learned about in Dayton likely went then. But, but that's where you have to say the likely, because I will not put details in my books that I can't back up. And then if there is a question, then I always talk about it in the source notes. But that is the frustration of the exact moments and exactly how that information likely through the consulate, likely through the handler's connection to the consulate, likely in December 1945, mm-hmm. but there's no proof of that. And you have to realize, oh, well, we could go into great details here, but the challenges of that, the adventure of figuring that out, but the timelines, the individuals involved, their timelines, the timelines of the events surrounding them, and the timelines of George Koval have to be pieced together to come as close as possible. I'm sort of hoping that someone's going to pop up and say, oh, you know, I live in London now. I read your book and I know all the answers to these questions. <laughs> I'm 110 years old and I can tell you all this. Yeah. Well, I wonder at this time, is there any suspicion from the FBI that somebody has infiltrated the Manhattan Project. I'm sure there were other figures that were very cautious about this, but is there anything you can point to that it seems like they're starting to pick up a scent and go after him? Or does he completely remain off the radar the entire time he's involved with the Manhattan Project? Oh, yeah. No, he's off the radar the entire time. There's no evidence. of, And I searched very thoroughly for that because I was skeptical, especially when I found out he had a Jeep. I thought, oh, you know, maybe he's, you know, not what he appears to be. Maybe he's, I mean, not what he appears to appear to be, (laughs) you know, but the book shows how close the the defections and the detections after the end of the war, how close those came to him in terms of the operations his handler was involved in. So it was... uh, tight moving. And I'm sure that's why he turned down a fabulous job at the end of the war. Monsanto offered him a job and he turned it down. And I think the GRU and his handler, I think everyone was disappointed because he could have continued sending information about the polonium and all of the trigger production was moved to Dayton by I don't know, 1949, I think, 1950. And so if he had taken that job at Monsanto, he would have been able to send all kinds of information. But once he was out of the army, there would have been a new security check. End of the war, out of the army, 
taking a new job at a company, he would, and, and I think he was smart enough to realize that could have endangered him because, you know, there were things in his record to show that he didn't live in Sioux City in the 1930s. All they would have had to do was go to Sioux City and interview people, and they would have found out the truth. And he had been arrested. There was an arrest record in the county of Sioux City's in and the county records for a protest. He had done protesting poverty. He spent a night maybe two nights in jail because of the protests. I think that was 1931. Oh, and also he was chosen in the state of Iowa to be the Iowa representative of the young communists at a communist convention in Chicago in 1930. Those were in records. Yeah, they really don't do uh, background (laughs) clearance to the level that you would hope for. So it sounds like that he wasn't too far away from being caught if uh, the wrong set of circumstances wouldn't happen. And that's where kind of the tension and suspense in the story is that that turning point. I mean, you always have to look at turning points and stories like this. Right. And what were the turning points? You know, the story in the prologue, the decision that he made to leave in October of 1948, um, big turning point in 1948 for him. And I think it was probably a big turning point when he turned down the Monsanto and then he moved back to New York, kept a low profile, lived in the Bronx again, but he also lived in a different neighborhood in the Bronx where he didn't have any connections to any former colleagues or comrades and he went back to school so what happened he got into the bowling league yeah (laughs) so what happens after he's finished with the manhattan project he's in america for a while what eventually causes him to leave the country well what's happening in america the anti-communism building and building in that period from 1946 on you know, from the time he is demobilized in February of 1946 on, there is uh, the House Un-American Activities Committee building pressure and eventually power. And there are more defections, I think. Anyhow, he is surrounded by uh, a huge challenge as someone who obviously wants to get out of Dodge. You know, he puts in a request, I think, in the spring of 1946 to be taken back to the Soviet Union. But it takes more than two years, partly because things were kind of frozen in terms of the Soviet espionage around that time in early 46 because of all kinds of, like I said, defections and detections. So he uses his time well, I think, during that period, a two-year period between the time he requests a return to the time he goes. But there's a building of animosity toward the Soviet Union and communism and its building in this country. And, you know, he knows he's got to leave. Plus, one of his cohorts did leave. He was walking on thin ice and he knew it. So I think that once he's able to leave, he goes back to the Soviet Union. He's never discovered. His story isn't even known until archives are unsealed after the fall of the USSR. What would you say is his legacy? He's unique in that regard that he was never discovered because many spies, even if they are successful, their story is known in different ways. But what do you think is unique about him? Oh, gosh, that's what the book shows. (laughs) I can't answer that in a short way. You know, I really can't because if I were reviewing the book, instead of having written the book, I could probably answer it in a very quick way. It's the timing in history. I'm going to quote you something I just got two weeks ago from a Russian scholar who is knowledgeable about Koval, lives in Moscow. He wrote this to me. George Koval's life journey through the 20th century's American and Russian destinies and his work as an intelligence agent had such an impact on world history that his personality and fate will long be the subject of study in both Russia and the United States. 
So I think everything from his methods, his blending in, his decisions, the network he worked in, what he sent, what happened to him when he returned, all, all of it. The legacy of George Koval is sort of the legacy of exactly what Professor Lebedev said in this quote that his journey through the 20th century's American and Russian destinies. Also, people have been commenting about the anti-Semitism. There was a review in a New York uh, publication a couple of weeks ago, New York Journal of Books. And the reviewer said something about how the subtext of anti-Semitism was all through his life. And when he returned, I, one of the most fascinating parts of the story to me, and it was a great surprise, and thank God for my wonderful Russian translator who discovered the source, but when Stalin died on March 5th, 19. 53. And the funeral was March 9th, I think. And George Koval wrote a letter to the GRU, the head of the GRU, I think, on March 10th, 1953, explaining that, you know, he had this advanced degree, he was having a very hard time finding work, because when he returned in 1948, he returned in the midst of immense anti-Semitism. You know, he was surrounded by anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism when he returned in 1948. So there he was in the mire of isms again. And, you know, he got his advanced degree and then he couldn't find work. There was a big scare among in the Jewish population, a fears of another purge in March of 1953. And so he wrote a letter saying, you know, I made a pledge. I can't reveal what I did for you from 1939 to 1949, but you know, you have the records, you know, I need your help. And immediately, and I don't have the dates right in front of me, but within days, I mean, maybe March 14th or March 16th, a letter went out to the head of Mendeleev saying, find work for this gentleman. And he did a great deal for his country. If you need us to tell you exactly what that was, we will send a representative. So that is one of the most fascinating details uncovered in the book, I think. And there's more to it than that, but in a very interesting moment in his life. So here you have a person whose parents were fighting anti-Semitism in Tsarist Russia, then believing in the American dream once they came here, then the Russian Revolution, there's anti-Semitism made illegal by the communists, then anti-Semitism arises in the 1920s. He graduates from high school in 1929 at the age of 15. So think of what his childhood up to that point was. He becomes very committed to the ideal, returns to Russia, is very expertly trained as becomes a Red Army intelligence officer, comes back to America, is a spy for eight years, returns to a uh, morass of anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. So there's no parade for George when he returns to the Soviet Union in 1948 because he's an American. He was born in America and he's Jewish. So those were two of the biases bursting forth in Moscow at the time of his return. So a uh, very interesting life. Going back to Professor Lebedev's quote and my good friend Nick Clooney's comment about how the biography of George Koval, basically his life connected him to the intensity of the Cold War battle, the American dream versus the communist workers paradise. I think those are intriguing and very solid interpretations of his significance. There are a lot of lessons learned in this. It's not just the story of Soviet espionage in the 1940s wartime America. It really does show that I think we have often underestimated the scientific and uh, we've underestimated maybe the determination and expertise of Russian espionage, military intelligence, and also the capabilities of the Russians in science and technology. I think we've always underestimated that. Well, there's a lot more to get into the story. And as we said, I mean, he's not as well known as other spies, but his story is very consequential. So for listeners who want to check it out, the name of the book is Sleeper Agent, The Atomic Spy in America Who Got Away. <laughs> 
And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. There you have it. That is all for today's episode. Once again, I want to start things off by thanking the Spy Masters of History Unplugged. I'll explain what that is in a second. Our Spy Masters include Bill Ivey, Moondoggy from Ohio, Tom from Ohio, Ryan Gillen, Rob from Chicago, Nick Brooks, Michael from New York, Carl from Norway, Josh Reddick, Jennifer French Lee, Jay Carrington, McCraze, Salvador Sanchez, David Santi, Chris C., and Baron Fraser. If you'd like to support the show, there's some very easy ways to do so. First, go to the site halfpricehistory.com. I've worked out an arrangement with a lot of the authors who've appeared on this show, and you can go there and get their books for 50% off. All you have to do is go to halfpricehistory.com and enter the promo code UNPLUGGED at checkout. Second, please leave a review and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player of choice, whether Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or whatever. Third, join our Facebook group. You can go to Facebook and search for History Unplugged. There, you can talk with other fans of the show about recent episodes, what you liked, what you didn't like. Also, I have exclusive content there, such as live streams, where I do live versions of podcast episodes where you can leave feedback as I'm talking, and I will address it on air. Last, and I think this is the best, is to join our membership program, the Knowlton's Rangers. The Knowlton's Rangers were George Washington's spies during the Revolutionary War, but it's also the name of the membership program for History Unplugged. If you go to patreon.com slash unplugged, you can join the membership program at three levels. If you join at the scout level, you'll get all 400 episodes of History Unplugged absolutely ad-free and early access to new episodes. If you join at the second level, the intelligence officer level, get all the stuff that scouts get along with bonus episodes. There's currently about 40 of them, including series on Audie Murphy and Operation Long Jump about the Nazi attempt to assassinate FDR, Churchill, and Stalin in 1943. Finally, if you join at the spy master level, you'll get a shout out to you and or your business at the end of each episode. You get a three pack of hardcover history history books, and you can find out what those are if you go to patreon.com slash unplugged. Finally, you can ask me a question about history on absolutely any topic on earth, and I will research it and devote an entire episode to your question. Probably about 30% of the questions in the archive for the show have been based on these sorts of questions. So there you go. Go to patreon.com slash unplugged to learn more.